Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You're very welcome to the Centre Culturel Irlandais, housed in, of course, what was once uh, the Irish College, um, and really the most important Irish College of, of, of the, the network that uh, exists. Um, the Centre Culturel Irlandais is part of today a network of about 57 um, art centres from around the world. And um, I say this because we're relatively young uh, in terms, of, uh, as art centres go, we're 16 years old this year, um, and certain centres uh, have been in Paris per for perhaps 50 years. But of course, none of those centres have the history that the Centre Culturel Irlandais has, um, being housed in the Irish College, which which has been home to to this particular college, to Irish um, to Irish since the the 18th century. So we have explored over the past couple of years that history. Um, with lectures by Monsignor Brendan Devlin and also Tom O'Connor. And this evening I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Liam Chambers, who um, will talk to us about um, that period from the 18th century, I suppose from, well, as you can see, I think 16, where are we? 1660 up to 1815. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you. And uh, please hand over and please a, a warm welcome for Liam Chambers. Thank you. Um, so uh, I'll just begin by saying thank you very much for um, uh, the welcome. Uh, I'd like to thank Nora in particular for the very kind invitation to come and speak this evening and to thank the staff of the college for help with the practical stuff and for their welcome um, as well. So the talk this evening explores the history of the Irish College or the Irish Colleges in Paris over a long period beginning in 1660 and ending uh, with a royal decree of 1818, uh, 200 years ago this year. So when Patrick Boyle, um, and this is Patrick Boyle, this formidable character here, when he wrote his history of the college in 1901, uh, Patrick Boyle emphasized two themes which I think are worth revisiting. First of all, he told a story of continuity from the little community established by John Lee in 1578 through the flourishing college under the leadership of Thomas Messingham in the 1620s and the 1630s and on to his own time as superior of the college. And Patrick Boyle was superior of the college here for 37 years from 1889 until 1926 and then he retired as superior and he kept on teaching until 1932 when he died. Secondly, Boyle was in no doubt about why the college was important. It had provided clergy for the Irish mission in a period of repression. Without the Irish college in Paris and the other Irish colleges on the continent, wrote Boyle, and I'm quoting here, the preservation of the faith in Ireland in the 17th and 18th centuries would have been impossible. So as well as telling the story of the Irish colleges from 1660 to 1818, my uh, little talk this evening suggests a slightly different approach to understanding this history. In reality, the college's story is much messier than Boyle allowed. And while the provision of priests for the Irish mission, especially during this penal era of the 18th century was important, the college also facilitated the permanent migration of Irish Catholics to the continent. So in 1660, Paris, a city of perhaps half a million people, was one of the more important destinations for Irish Catholic students who were unable to access higher education at home, along with places like Louvain, like Salamanca, like Rome, and there were many others. Despite this, and there were hundreds of Irish students in Paris, despite this, the infrastructure for the reception of Irish students in the city was severely underdeveloped. Thomas Messingham's vibrant college had been reduced to a tiny, struggling, 
band of students, perhaps as few as three or four, living in rented space with Edward Turrell, who was a Meath priest and had been superior of this little tiny college since 1638. Most Irish students in the city therefore lived elsewhere, some in small communities, such as the 20 or so led by Dermot Hederman, who lived in the Collège Saint-Barbe, not far from here, or the group living together in the Faubourg Saint-Germain, who were the subject of this 1662 appeal for funding. Uh, as you'll see uh, over here, uh, Oliver Cromwell gets dishonorable mention. Now, attempts to bring these scattered Irish groups together in the 1660s came to nothing, and the situation became even more difficult in the 1670s when Tyrrell's Irish College split into two competing groups three years after his death, one under a man called David Mulcahill and another led by a priest called Peter Nugent. By this stage, moves were already underway to bring together these growing and diverse student uh, and clerical communities of Irish in Paris into something new, a new entity. And the main figure here was someone who is frequently left out of the Irish college story, so I'm putting him back in. This was John O'Maloney, a priest from Killaloo who had been in Paris since the 1640s. In 1668 or 1669, O'Maloney created what he would later describe as the Congregatio Hibernorum. The Congregation of the Irish, if we can translate it like that, brought together Irish priests and scholars on Sundays for, and I'm quoting here, spiritual exercises, sermons, exhortations, catechisms, and conferences on cases of conscience. It was clearly a bundle of laughs on a Sunday for the Irish. In 1672, O'Maloney returned to Ireland as Bishop of Killaloo. And in his absence, his brother, Matthew, drew up a set of rules and constitutions for, as he put it, the education and spiritual advantage of the priests, clerics, and all the rest of his countrymen, as well as the most strict and perfect union of provinces and he also offered funding for a new Irish college. Now, this is a copy of the rules. It's a draft copy, which for some reason is currently in a library uh, in Yale University. There's another copy of this uh, in Cambridge University Library. There's no copy of this, as far as I know, anywhere in France. Uh, this was digitized by Yale because apparently they use it for uh, handwriting classes, for paleography classes. From the O'Maloney Initiative, a new sense of coherence emerges among the Irish in Paris. To maintain order, four officers were to be elected, uh, each, uh, sorry, to be created, each to be elected every second year. The difficulties arising from the behaviour of some of the Irish in Paris were to be tackled. Vagabonds were to be expelled, disorder and faction were to be prevented, new arrivals were to be vetted, and those who had completed their studies were to be sent home. The evidence suggests, I think, that this Congregatio Hibernorum was the main organizing influence on the Irish in Paris in the mid-1670s, notwithstanding the fact that there were two colleges claiming to be the Irish College, run by Mulcahill and Nugent. It's reasonable to assume, therefore, that this Congregatio was behind the most important event of this period, and that was the acquisition by the Irish of a new residence in the summer of 1676. And this was, of course, the Collège des Lombards, an unused university college located in the heart of the university quarter on Rue des Carmes, just as I'm sure you all know, uh, around the corner. The documents of 1676 and 1677, which recorded the Irish takeover of the Collège des Lombards, make no mention of the two men who would come to be seen as central to that enterprise, uh, two Irish priests, Patrick McGinn and Malachy Kelly. And we have no pictures of uh, Patrick McGinn or Malachy Kelly, um, uh, but there are their uh, signatures, McGinn, uh, and on Kelly. There are very few documents where, where the two signatures are together. 
Yet when the Archbishop of Paris approved rules for the college in May 1679, their role in refounding and rebuilding the college was very clear. McGinn and Kelly basically bankrolled uh, the enterprise. And though the sources vary in the question of how much the two priests contributed, the cost of rebuilding was between 30 and 40,000 livres, according to contemporary sources. When McGinn and Kelly died in 1683 and 1684, the Collège des Lombards had been transformed into an Irish college. It was still a very small institution, dominated by students from two Irish provinces, from Ulster and from Munster. And it was comparable in size to the equally small and competing Irish colleges, still out there, dominated by students from Leinster, run by Mulcahill, and at this stage, a man called Terence Fitzpatrick, who had usurped the position of Peter Nugent. Now, Mulcahill and Fitzpatrick, busy running Irish colleges, must have followed progress on Rue des Carmes with some trepidation, for they both took steps to secure their colleges in the face of this new arrival. Their actions ultimately came to nothing. In 1684, Following the deaths of McGinn and Kelly, representatives from all four Irish provinces, from Ulster, Munster, Leinster, and Connacht, met to negotiate an end to the interprovincial rivalry which so marked the Irish student community in Paris. As a consequence, the colleges led by Mulcahill and Fitzpatrick were shut down. They were forcibly uh, shut down. And a group of Leinster students entered the Collège des Lombards in 1685. To ensure stability, it was agreed that the college would have four elected proviseur administrators, one from each province. So the College des Lombards, now the undisputed Irish college in Paris, was still a small community with around 30 ordained priests as James II ascended the thrones of his three kingdoms of England, Scotland and Ireland in 1685. Most Irish students, ordained priests and unordained students, continued to live outside the Irish college. In 1693, at least three small communities of younger Irish students were brought together into a building, uh, the Hotel Saint-Michel, on... on... there, sorry about that, on Rue Traversine. So I know many of you from Paris don't need a map for this. This is Turgot's uh, 1730s map, as you know. So the Collège des Lombards is here, um, and Rue Traversine runs along here. This is the Collège de Navarre uh, here. Uh, so this was, was just a short walk away. So this group at Rue Traversine appears to have been quite substantial, with contemporary references suggesting maybe 50, maybe 60 students in the mid-1690s, probably larger, actually, than the Irish College in Rue des Carmes. Understandably, the men in charge of the Rue Traversine community, uh, Thady Nolan, Dennis O'Brien, and later Malachy Fogarty, uh, who I mentioned because I'll mention him again, saw the Collège des Lombards as their route to stability. And following a sustained campaign, the Council of State decided in their favor in 1707, uh, when it ordered that the younger students should be allowed in to the, the Collège des Lombards. And they entered the college two years later in 1709. Although we can't be sure the college registers have not, unfortunately, survived. Fragmentary evidence suggests that the college expanded rapidly in the early 18th century, and the student body might have exceeded 100 by the 1710s. The College des Lombards now housed a complex student population drawn from across Ireland, and this complexity reflected the insecurity and, above all, the poverty of the Irish Catholic Church and community. To overcome the financial limitations on access to higher education, many Irish students 
arrived in Paris in their mid-twenties as already ordained priests. This meant that they had an income from stipends received for saying mass and performing other clerical duties. The Rue Traversine community, which entered the college in 1709, was comprised of younger students, ranging from boys in their mid-teens, possibly younger, to young men in their early 20s, many destined for ordination, but some to pursue lay careers, particularly um, in medicine. These students did not have access to the kind of income of the priests. So instead, they drew on personal wealth, charitable donations, and increasingly in the 18th century, investments or fondation made by wealthy benefactors for the education of Irish students. Between the, 1660, sorry, the 1680s and the 1780s, 53 fondations were created for Irish students, providing a total annual income in 1789 of 67,494 livres. This is the bit where I do in today's money that would be, but I have no idea how much it is. I don't know how people do this. I don't know how much that is in today's money. A lot, let's put it like that. Now, not all these fondations were linked to the Irish college and they were open to both priests and students who were not priests. This um, unsophisticated table <laughs> gives you a sense of the growth of fondations. So these are fondations and these are uh, bursaries provided by the Fondation. So it slowly grows during the 18th century and trickles off again uh, towards the end of the century. Many of those who created these Fondation added very careful stipulations indicating a preference for family members, which ensured that they operated as a kind of property, mainly it would seem for middling sort, reasonably well-to-do Irish families. The student population at the Collège des Lombards was therefore differentiated by age, older and younger students, but also, I think, by social background. Younger students from wealthier backgrounds living alongside older, ordained priests of more humble origins. Initially, however, there were very few signs of tension. Malachy Fogarty, who leads the younger students into the Collège des Lombards, did not, uh, his role did not prevent his fellow priests electing him as Munster Proviseur in 1716. When Fogarty died, however, in 1722 and was replaced as head of the younger students by Andrew Dunleavy, the situation changed and a squabble about funding led to a new set of regulations which were of great significance to the college. The rules, the new rules, adopted a radical solution to the problem of divisions in the college by formally dividing it into two communities. On the one side, a community of priests, and on the other side, a community of clerics and scholars. The two communities were to be composed of an equal number and to be balanced in composition of students from each of the four provinces. Now, all of the developments, and there's quite a lot of developments that I've been talking about, took place in parallel with the shipwreck, as the Irish, Gaelic Irish poet Davy O'Brudor uh, put it, of the Irish Catholic community at home, following the glorious revolution of 1688 and the defeat of James II's largely Catholic Irish army in 1689 to 1691. The enactment of penal legislation against Catholics soon followed from 1695 onwards. One result of all of this was a wave of Irish migration to France, perhaps 19,000 alone in the winter of 1691 to 1692. So this is uh, James and Louis uh, allegedly meeting in 1689. As the researches of Natalie Jenny Rufiak, Liam Swords, Priscilla O'Connor, Marion Lyons and others have illustrated, the Collège des Lombards was well placed to play an important role in the integration of these migrants into France. The files of the notary Jean Fromont, whose offices were around the corner from the Collège des Lombards, are full of Irish migrant files. 
Through Fromont, the well-connected priests in the college were able to provide a range of services to recently arrived and sometimes more settled migrants. They handled investments, they drew up testimonials, they certified claims to nobility, they verified succession rights, they translated documents, they provided charity. While the later 1690s and the first decades of the 18th century witnessed serious persecution in Ireland, as early as the 1730s, the pressure on Irish Catholics at home had eased dramatically, and the evidence of a 1731 government report suggests that the church, the Catholic Church in Ireland, was growing, not receding, across much of the island. Now, this encouraged a debate within the Irish Catholic Church about how best to respond to a real, if fragile, sense of toleration. One school of thought was that the number of priests in Ireland was too great and that ordaining older students before sending them abroad was giving rise to problems. In the Collège des Lombards, this view was championed by Andrew Donlevy, who was the head of the community of younger students, and by a priest called John Burke, who was the Munster Proviseur from 1728. And they begin a campaign to reduce or even to close the community of priests and to reserve the Collège des Lombards for the younger community of clerics and scholars. In 1735, John Burke explained to James III, son of James II, that the community of priests, and this is what he says, comprised uncouth, illiterate priests from the country who for the most part enter into orders without a call. Burke had an alternative vision for the college, and I quote, he wanted to use it for lodging the children of your majesty's subjects, either officers in the army or reduced gentlemen's children, out of which nursery several fine plants may spring up, capable hereafter to serve God and your majesty in the church if they are called, to it, or in the army, or some other employment. Now, Don Levy and Burke's campaign may not have been taken very seriously, but for the support of the college's new patron, a well-connected French ecclesiastic, Nicolas Guillaume de Beautru, known as the Abbé de Vaubrun. Vaubrun bankrolled a major rebuilding program at the college in the 1730s, including the construction of a new chapel designed by the architect Pierre Boscri. Boscri's chapel borrowed directly from his Roman experience and specifically from the church of Sant'Andrea al Quirinale by uh, Bernini. So this is, these are late 19th century images of the church on Rudy Carm today, I'm sure all of you um, know it, uh, and this image from the Musée Carnavale shows um, the, one of the buildings that I think Boscri uh, designed in the um, 1730s. Crucially, behind Vaubrun, one can detect the influence of Louis XV's virtual first minister, Cardinal Fleury, and the Archbishop of Paris. For Fleury and the Archbishop, the Collège des Lombards provided a welcome ally in the battle against Parisian Jansenism, and they appear to have encouraged Vaubrun to pour money into reconstruction. Indeed, Boscri's Roman-style chapel must have made a particularly strong impression on those involved in the Jansenist quarrels of the 1730s. Naturally, the community of priests were appalled by Dunleavy and Burke's initiative to basically uh, eject them from the college. And for four years, between 1733 and 1737, the Irish College witnessed what the priests later called open warfare. The priests argued that the community of clerics and scholars provided few priests for the Irish mission and they rallied most, but not all, of the Irish bishops in their cause. Eventually, the reform initiative ran out of steam, but the arguments and the counter-arguments signaled the importance of the college for the Irish church and the beginning of a debate about how, the Irish, how Irish Catholics would respond 
to the easing of penal legislation. In consequence, the issues did not disappear. The debate erupted again in the 1740s and was only finally solved when the Irish bishops reduced the number of priests they were sending to Paris in the 1750s and new accommodation was made available for the younger community of clerics and scholars. Now, if the reformers, the priests and the bishops were agreed on anything, it was that the College des Lombards and indeed the French capital more generally had become the single most important centre for the education and formation of Irish Catholics on the continent. The groundbreaking work of the English historian Lawrence Brockless on patterns of student attendance at the University of Paris during the Ancien Regime illustrate that the early 18th century represented an important high point before student mobility returned uh, to lower levels in the later 18th century. So these data are taken from Brockless's work. Now, what Brockless did was he trolled university uh, records and other sources. And while uh, this provides invaluable data, Brockless noted that his sources were incomplete. For a large number of Irish students who passed through the teaching halls of the University of Paris, whether resident at the Collège des Lombards or not, do not appear on the records of the university. One reason is that matriculation and graduation records are themselves incomplete. Another, more important perhaps, consideration is that not all Irish students undertook the expensive pro process of acquiring a degree as the culmination of their course of study. As Brockless notes, only 10% of students who featured on occasional lists drawn up in the 17th and 18th centuries appear in university records. And this is backed up by things that I've come across. Um, for example, on four petitions drawing up during the, the debates I was talking about in the 1730s, 197 Irish priests signed their names. Documents like this one which is in Rome. And of these 197 priests who sign, only 23 turn up in university records. The rest of them don't appear anywhere else at all. Now, this underpins, I think, the point that the 1,214 in the previous table represents only a proportion, and a small one that of the total number of Irish in Paris. It is impossible to estimate with any accuracy the number of Irish students who did study in Paris before the revolution, but it's clear that the individuals whose names were recorded in the university and other sources are a minority, and that a figure I think of 5,000 would not be unreasonable, and it might be a rather conservative estimate. The most important finding to emerge from Brockless, uh, along with Patrick Ferte's research, related to something else, to the rate of return to Ireland of students educated in Paris. When Brockless compared the list of students educated in Paris between 1679 and 1693 with those recorded on a 1705 list of Catholic priests in Ireland, he found that only 35% of the Paris students had returned home again. Comparison of a later generation of students in Paris between 1721 and 1735 with partial lists of Irish priests in 1744 revealed that only 30% of the students appear to have returned. Now, neither of these figures is strictly accurate, but it is clear that a large proportion probably a majority of Irish students in Paris did not return to the Irish mission as priests. Some may have returned in other capacities, of course, but not as priests. And I think this fits with the evidence of Irish and French priests and officials in Paris who had long commented on the failure of students to return to Ireland. In 1717, taking just one example, the University of Paris authorities condemned those, and I'm quoting, who, after completing their time in the college, instead of returning home, they seek out easier circumstances and fortunes for themselves in this city or elsewhere, 
elsewhere through France and thus remain idle, at least in regards to missions. Now, rather than viewing this as a flaw in the college system, as contemporaries did, and as Patrick Boyle, who I mentioned earlier, certainly did, it makes more sense to think about the colleges as facilitators of both mission and migration. Put simply, thousands of Irish students pass through the Irish College in Paris, or at least through the university, and on to careers in France or elsewhere in the continent. This was precisely what their families had intended. By the mid-18th century, the physical space occupied by the Collège des Lombards had expanded significantly since the first Boursier occupied the building in 1676. You can get some sense of the college from a plan drawn up during an inspection of the buildings occupied by the community of clerics and scholars in 1772. I came across this plan a year or two ago uh, in the course of doing some research, and I don't think it's been used by historians of the Irish College um, before. So this is 1772. This is the College de Lombard. This is the chapel. Uh, Rue des Carmes is down here. You enter the college here, and the college was divided between the building for the priests, which ran around here, and the pink, which was inspected in 1772. And the pink is the area occupied by the community of clerics and scholars. You have a large um, courtyard uh, here. Uh, the college community and visitors accessed the college via a door and passageway on Rue de Carmes. Um, the 1728 regulations tell us that a porter was in charge and that the door was shut at 9 o'clock in the winter and 10 o'clock in the summer. This brought you into a great courtyard with the college chapel at the far end. So the, the priest's buildings are mainly to the right as you look here and the community of clerics and scholars mainly to the left. And the space was enclosed by the densely populated city around it. Um, internally, there were, however, some uh, common spaces. You get some sense of what the college was like in 17, the 1730s from Turgot's uh, plan. You can see there's no chapel. This was drawn before the chapel was constructed. There's no priest's building, which happens later, uh, as I understand it as well. Now, as it expanded numerically and physically, the Collège des Lombards also emerged as a significant cultural institution for Irish Catholics in the 18th century, in a sense reclaiming the role that it had under Thomas Messingham in the early, 18th, early 17th century. The College and the wider Irish community in Paris produced scholars of note in history, in philosophy, in medicine, and in theology. I'm going to leave those. I could say a lot about those, but I'm going to leave those. I will say a word, however, about language. The evidence provided by an Irish student and priest called Manus O'Rourke in the early 18th century reminds us of the multilingual world inhabited by the Irish in Paris. Latin in the church and classroom, French on the street, English and Irish in daily discourse. In the 18th century, Paris developed as a significant centre of Irish language scholarship and publication. The casting of an Irish type in 1730 enabled the Parisian printer Jacques Guérin to publish Conor O'Begley's English and Irish Dictionary in 1732. Now, O'Begley's identity has been the subject of some debate. So... Um, yeah, this is the English and Irish Dictionary uh, at the top. This is Conor O'Begley uh, here. Um, as has the extent of his cooperation with Hugh McCurtain, who appears to have written the dictionary with him. One possibility is that O'Begley was the Munster Proviseur at the Collège des Lombards, Thady Begley, though the, the four names are different. Um, and this would place him squarely within the, the college's cultural ambit, but the evidence is ambiguous for that. The book's dedication, however, to the Abbé de Vaubrun, who bankrolls the reconstruction of the college at exactly the same time, uh, is very interesting um, and I think is, is very significant too. 
1736, Philippe Joseph Perrotin donated 12,000 livres for the creation of a school in the college to teach the Irish language. The funding was also to be used to distribute prizes among the community of clerics and scholars. And Perrotin's donation might be best understood in the context, context of this conflict that's going on in the college in the 1730s because the community of priests accuse the community of clerical, clerics and scholars of being linguistically incompetent, particularly um, in Irish, and therefore unsuitable for the Irish mission. Andrew Dunleavy's 1742 um, English-Irish Catechism, published uh, in Paris, was almost certainly conceived in the same context, and Dunleavy was a great promoter of ejecting the community of priests from the Irish College. Paris remained a centre of Irish language scholarship in the later 18th century. In 1768, John O'Brien's English-Irish Dictionary appeared in the city, thanks in large part to assistance provided from within the Collège des Lombards. In the 1780s, an Irish Protestant visitor to Paris reported that at least in the community of clerics and scholars, which by this stage had moved to this building, uh, and, I, and I'll quote to explain what he says. He says, by an old institution, they say a catechism every Sunday in the Irish language, and every Friday they translate into Irish. But what is astonishing, totally neglect the English language. They are neither permitted to read any English authors, nor have any offices in class to teach them this most necessary accomplishment. That's 1788. By mid-century then, approximately 165 students were crammed into the Collège des Lombards. In the 1750s, John O'Neill, who'd taken over from Andrew Dunleavy as the prefect of the younger students, had abandoned any hope of ejecting the community of priests, and he sought instead to use Irish and French funding to purchase new accommodation for the students in his care. O'Neill's strategy gradually developed into an even more ambitious plan to acquire an entirely new building outside the Collège des Lombards. This was the brainchild of O'Neill's close colleague, Lawrence Kelly, an Armagh priest who was working as O'Neill's assistant in the mid-1750s and took over as prefect following O'Neill's death in 1761. In August 1768, Kelly acquired letters patent permitting the community of clerics and scholars to acquire a house in Rue du Cheval Vert, along with two small properties on the adjacent Rue des Postes. And this cost 45,000 uh, livres. Uh, so this is, um, I'm sure you've all seen this image, this is Rue des Carmes, sorry, Rue du Cheval Vert from uh, Turgot's um, plan. In 1769, Kelly purchased the building and a country house at Ivry for 21,000 livres in his own name through the offices of an Irish banker in Paris. And in 1772, he then donated the properties to the community of clerics and scholars. And that document of donation is happily in the archives here. The country house came with a large garden two smaller gardens, orchards, vegetable plots, and a chapel above the refectory. The building inspector's report, which I mentioned already, makes it clear that work on rebuilding this property on Rue du Cheval Vert did not commence until 1772 at the earliest. François-Joseph Bélanger has been identified as the architect who oversaw the reconstruction of the new building. And my sense is that while the evidence is not extensive for that. There is enough to accept that attribution. The reconstruction was a major undertaking and Lawrence Kelly looked beyond France to uh, Irish benefactors for assistance. In 1772, he penned a carefully calibrated address to the growing number of Catholic merchants and professionals back home. 
The level of support from Ireland is not clear, but the building work on the new college was completed in early 1776, when the community of clerics and scholars made the trip from Rudy Carm up the hill to the promised land here in the Irish College. With two colleges and perhaps as many as 180 students, the Irish student community in Paris accounted for just over one third of Irish students on the continent in the 1780s, if we exclude the colleges of the Franciscans, Dominicans, Augustinians, and others. The new college was received very positively by visitors, but the two Irish colleges were in very serious financial difficulties in the 1780s. The new college was heavily indebted for the obvious reason of reconstruction and construction. Meanwhile, income was also falling at the Collège des Lombards. In June 1783, one college official, Peter Flood, explained why, and I'm quoting. He says, the sensible decay of piety and religion in every order and description of the people renders the calls to the, the altar daily less frequent and less beneficial. The effects are visible. The mass stipends on which the priests of the College de Lombard depended appear to have been drying up. A mounting sense of crisis resulted in a significant change in 1787. The system of governance by four proviseurs was scrapped in favour of a single administrator, a Killaloo priest called John Baptist Walsh, who you'll find on a plaque on the wall somewhere in the courtyard there. Walsh immediately set about trying to improve the college finances, but he had barely made progress when rather more pressing matters arose. So John Baptist Walsh in Rue des Carmes and Charles Carney, who was the superior of the college here on Rue du Cheval Vert, and the students of the two Irish colleges witnessed the French Revolution at close quarters. Irish students continued to arrive in Paris well into the early 1790s, however, although not as late as this 1794 English satirical image suggests. This is a, a satirical image, as you can tell, by the English satirist Richard Newton called The Progress of an Irish Man, uh, and it has a, a wonderful image which has not really been used very much by historians before. So the very first image at the top um, up here is an Irish student and the, the text which you can't read says, going to school and eating a potato for his breakfast. Uh, all Irish people eat potatoes for their breakfast, obviously. But the second image is setting out for the Irish college in Paris to be made a priest. It's the only image like this I've ever seen of an Irish student going to Paris in the 18th century. Now, by 1794, no Irish student <laughs> was going to Paris, but it's a wonderful image to have. And you can see he made it. He's swinging the incense uh, in the next image. Uh, but if you go back by this one, he renounces the church. Uh, and he becomes an actor, and then he becomes a soldier, and he becomes a gambler. He does many other things until down here he eventually, uh, he eventually dies. But back to the story of uh, the students who did come to Paris. Initially, the momentous events happening in the streets around them made little practical difference in the day-to-day -day life of the college. There were, however, ominous early signs. Exactly 218 years ago today, this is the 6th of December, it's the feast of St. Nicholas, isn't it? It is, St. Nicholas, who I think is a patron saint of students. Yeah, so the students got a day off. On this day, 218 years ago, a small group of Irish students were arrested following accusations of damage to the great altar of the fatherland erected on the Champ de Mar. They had gone there uh, during their leisure time. They had walked from this college to the Champ de Mar. They were initially denounced as counter-revolutionaries. They were brought to trial, but they were eventually liberated. 
By this stage, the civil constitution of the clergy was ripping the French church apart. And Walsh and Carney, the two Irish college superiors, feigned a studied neutrality to the authorities. They basically argued that as Irish, they didn't have to take a position. But at the same time, they quietly opened the doors of the colleges to refractory clergy in 1791 and 1792, which eventually caused serious disturbances on the streets outside. By August 1792, many of the Irish students had left the city, and as the revolution radicalized, attacks on the colleges increased. In October 1792, a group of radical students and ex-students launched their own internal revolution in this building, and they took over the Irish College. Astonishingly, the student coup d'etat was defeated and the colleges limped on through much of 1793 and finally closed later in that year. Walsh, Kearney and the remaining students, and there were about 20 students left, succumbed to the arrest of British and Irish citizens ordered in October 1793 and many found themselves imprisoned in this building which acted as a prison during the revolution, well during the terror for a couple of years. The fall of Robespierre and his allies in the summer of 1794 paved the way for the release of the prisoners. By this stage, the Irish bishops had almost given up hope of recovering what they thought of as their interest in France. And the establishment of a seminary at Maynooth in County Kildare the following year provided them with an alternative higher education option for students. It fell there to the tiny band of prisoners to assert Irish claims to the college and more than a century of investments, the 67,494 livre that I mentioned a moment ago. In September 1795, Walsh and Kearney were restored to the property and the bursaries. And this marked the beginning of a very long struggle. The Collège des Lombards on Rue des Carmes never reopened as an Irish educational institution, although it remained in Irish ownership uh, for more than a century. The future of this college on Rue du Cheval Vert, although it was in desperate need of repair, looked more promising. Initially, Kearney rented out parts of the college to some booksellers, but in 1797, he installed an Irish teacher, Patrick McDermott, in the building. A friend of the journalist Andrew O'Reilly later recalled that students here read more Voltaire and Rousseau than sacred history, but that the school was the centre, he said, of gaiety and elegance. Success, of course, brought problems, unwanted attention, and as the French government restructured higher education in the capital, John Baptist Walsh was forced to conduct an intricate campaign to maintain the autonomy of the two Irish colleges. He succeeded, just about, and he was able to capitalise on the opportunity presented by the Concordat in 1801 and the Peace of Amiens in 1801 to 2. The future of the Irish colleges was then decided in a flurry of consular and imperial decrees issued in a four-year period between 1801 and 1805. The most significant provisions you will be glad to hear may be briefly summarized. In 1801, a bureau gratuit was created to oversee the administration of the property and revenues of the Irish colleges. By 1805, all of the pre-1789 Irish and English and Scots colleges in France had been united into a single entity called the British Establishment. Now, very few of the Irish or English or Scots were happy about this, but John Baptist Walsh, who was a great survivor of the revolutionary period, was appointed Administrator General. Walsh began preparing for the reopening of one college, this one, but he was faced with a very obvious problem. At its meeting, on the 31st of November, 1805, the Bureau noted, as they said, there are not in France 10 students from Ireland, England, or Scotland. 
The Irish, and indeed the English, and the Scottish bishops had no intention of sending students to Paris. Britain was at war, after all, with France, although they recognized the significant financial resources tied up there. Walsh, therefore, turned to French students, although from 1807, the college largely drew on the children of Irish, English, and Scottish migrants, many of them serving in the army of Napoleon Bonaparte. The modest success of the reopened college created the opportunity for further conflict. In particular, Walsh found himself in a long-running battle with Nicholas Madgett and Richard Ferris, long-term Irish residents in Paris who had embraced the French Revolution. In 1808, they were named to the Bureau, and the following year, they succeeded in having Walsh removed as Administrator General in favour of an English Benedictine priest called Henry Parker. The sources indicate that personal animosity was one root of the episode, but it also reflected something much more important. Despite everything, Walsh was still wedded to an image of the Irish college with pre-1789 roots. Ferris and Madgett, by contrast, viewed the college as a resource of the Irish migrant population in Paris, composed mainly of Republicans and Bonapartists who had arrived after 1789. In April 1813, Richard Ferris took over as Administrator General and he set about reordering the college, but he had made very little headway when, on the 3rd of May 1814, Louis XVIII entered Paris. I'm almost there. The restoration of Louis XVIII triggered a new struggle for control of the Irish, English and Scots colleges in France. From the Irish perspective, a three-way battle commenced involving John Baptist Walsh, Richard Ferris, and a new arrival, the man nominated as administrator of the colleges by the Irish bishops in December 1814, a Dublin priest called Paul Long. Under constant pressure from Ferris and his supporters and meeting several setbacks, Long slowly established his authority over the Irish establishments and he removed Ferris's students from the college. Now there was a lot of fight back, but he managed to do this. In 1817, after a break of almost a quarter of a century, the Irish bishops began to send students back to Paris. Meanwhile, Richard Ferris was on the bureau and he used this position to plot. In October 1817, Long complained, and I quote, the bureau is composed of atheists and all to a man intimates of Ferris who is himself a member of it. Much to Long's dismay, a royal order of the 17th of December, 1818, almost 200 years ago, relative to the administration of the British establishments, strengthened the bureau's authority over the college. The order reunited the Irish, English and Scots colleges. Louis XVIII had previously separated them. It ordered a financial inquiry targeted at Paul Long, proposed the reunion of all the students into one of the existing houses and threatened the sale of the other buildings. In the meantime, students were to be dispersed among other Parisian seminaries and institutions. Long viewed the 1818 order as a victory for Richard Ferris and his supporters, who had, as Long put it, sacrificed the ancient establishments of their country and brought on their probable immediate destruction. And he promptly tendered his resignation. In 1820, Richard Ferris reclaimed control in the position of Administrator General. But his victory was short-lived, and the changing direction of French politics in the 1820s as it lurched firmly to the right permitted Irish Catholic bishops a more substantial role in the college. Paul Long's failure was, in fact, more apparent than real. My own sense is that Paul Long played an almost completely forgotten but very important role 
in reshaping this college in the 19th century. So to try to draw some of these things together uh, in a conclusion. From an unpromising base in 1660, the Irish College in Paris developed into the most important centre for the higher education of Irish Catholics in the 18th century. That success was predicated on the scale of Irish migration to France and the availability of French and crucially Irish sources of patronage. It is therefore unsurprising, I think, that the college fulfilled not only a missionary role, it did send students back to Ireland as priests, but it also fulfilled a less frequently articulated migration function, one which was arguably just as important to the Irish Catholic community. On the eve of the revolution, more than a century of investment and patronage was tied up in Paris. This ultimately is why this college survived. More than any of the other Irish colleges in France, this college was worth the struggle. Beyond 1818, however, the college changed dramatically. By the 1820s, the Ancien Régime College, which was sort of deeply networked into the uh, structures of the University of Paris, had been transformed. It had been transformed into a 19th century seminary, one which was, in fact, much more important to the Irish Catholic Church in the 1800s and the early 1900s than historians have realized. Thank you very much for your attention.